Hello, and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura, and today I am talking about Sometimes a Great Notion by Ken Kesey, which I just finished reading for the second time. So I did read this last year, and I watched the movie, which stars Paul Newman and directed by Paul Newman. And afterwards, I did like an hour-long book first movie video, so I had a lot to say about it. And so even though I already have that long video, I still wanted to do another book review video, just sharing my thoughts about it now that I've read it twice. Also, I just wanted to show off this edition, which I recently got in the mail. I love this cover. I have a first ed edition copy right here, but the first edition is a very boring cover, <laughs> whereas this one is just so cool. I absolutely love it. And on top of that, this one is signed by Ken Kesey. It was made out to some guy named Peter, which funny enough, I have a brother named Peter, but I'm not giving this to him. This is for myself. And yeah, I am just so excited to have this incredible edition. So if you watched my videos last year, specifically my reading wrap up videos, when I determined like the best book of 2022, and then my end of year video where I decided which was the best, you will know that I loved this book so much. And now that I have read it twice, I am happy to report that it was still just as good the second time. And I still stand by the praise I gave it last year. And this book is around 650 pages, depending on what edition you get, but it is a lengthy book. However, it is a book where when you are reading it, at least for me, the time just flies by. Like some books you're reading it and then you're kind of like, huh, like how long have I been reading for? And it's only been like 10 minutes. Whereas this is one where I would read it and I like would not think to look at the clock until like a significant, a significant amount of time had passed. And the writing style is very unique. So we begin at the end and then we kind of go back in time and see how it all begins. And then near the end, we're brought back to that scene we had at the start of the book. But it also is just switching perspectives constantly. So we go from like an omniscient, you know, narrator to first person. But then in, when it's in first person, we're jumping around from character to character and it'll just change mid paragraph. <laughs> like we'll be getting like first person narration and then suddenly it switches to third person and then suddenly it switches to like Hank's perspective. And then suddenly, you know, mid paragraph, we switch to Lee's perspective now. And there's just so much going on. And sometimes it's broken up by being like in parentheses when it's a switching a perspective. Sometimes it'll be italicized and other times it just switches up. <laughs> without changing the font. So it does take some getting used to, and I know my first time reading it, I definitely needed that an adjustment period early on to like kind of get my bearings with how this book was written. The time jumps, plus on top of that, the perspective changes. Whereas this time around, I knew what I was getting into and also I knew the story. And so all of that helped me to be able to just jump right into the story. And I never felt lost or like needed to get my bearings. And so I think because of that, I was able to just notice so many more details that I had missed the first time around. And also when I read it last year, I like knew nothing about the story. Whereas this time, obviously I knew the entire story. And because I knew what was coming and I knew what like the bigger events were, I was surprised to realize that like one of the bigger things that happened, the ball doesn't even get rolling on that until like almost halfway. So I was pretty surprised because I was like, wow, that seems like it's such a big part of the book and yet it doesn't even begin until like the halfway point. And that's not to say that I thought the first half was boring or anything by any means, because I was always fully invested. And this is like a family saga. So the first half, where we learn about the characters, you know, the main characters are Hank, Lee, Viv, Joby, Henry. We're hearing about them currently, but we also go back in time and we hear about Henry's father and then Henry as he was growing up and then Hank and, you know, the, the posterity down the line and what happened to the mothers. And so I just love those family saga books. So even though I was surprised that the main thing wasn't happening yet, I wasn't bothered because I just loved reading about this family's history. And this book also, like I said, like you're just so sucked in and it just has great pacing. And there is a big moment, like one of the climactic moments happens at like the 75, 80% mark. And before it happens, like there's so much tension building up and he writes it so well. And I, it made me feel like I was watching a movie where like you're seeing what these different characters are doing and we keep jumping back and forth. And even though like nothing apparently is about to go wrong and you don't know what's gonna happen, but you can just feel it like something is going to happen. I have no idea what, <laughs> but I can tell from like this tension I'm feeling that clearly something big and something bad is going to take place. And then what does end up happening? I mean, I knew it based on having read it last year, but there's nothing about it where like you don't, he doesn't give you any clues as to what that thing will be. And so it's kind of like a mystery. You're just like on edge waiting for something and you don't even know what you're waiting for, but you're just so on edge. And then suddenly it happens. And yeah, so just 
great writing, great pacing, great job building the tension and foreshadowing, but he also foreshadows so well because there have been other books I've read. Specifically, I remember this in Secret Window by Stephen King, and he wrote Secret Window like in the 90s. So he was an accomplished writer at that point, but he has a line in that book that just feels so amateur, like something I would write <laughs> when if I was writing a story where he does foreshadowing where he says like, and he laid down to go to sleep, having no idea what was in store for him the next day, right? It's just so cliche and just so amateur, I feel like is the best way to describe foreshadowing when it's written that way. Whereas we get some foreshadowing and sometimes a great notion. And I wanted to share it because it's kind of long, but it's just so well written and it makes you curious like, whoa, like, so what happened? <laughs> because we have a character, Hank, and he is in the future reflecting back on something that happened that we haven't read about yet. And so it's foreshadowing. Clearly there's something he's thinking about where something went wrong, but we have no idea. And so it just makes you so curious to see what this thing is. Anyway, and it reads, yeah, a fellow can look back and add up all the reasons and say, well, it ain't really so hard to figure out how come I was so punchy and so loggy and so careless about working at the state park the next day. What with all the hassle banging around me so long? No, not really so hard. But just the same, being able to look back and give reasons and all that still don't do much toward making a man proud of what happened because of them reasons. Not if he can look back as well and see how he could have kept it from... No, not could. Look back and see how, by God, he should have kept it from happening. There's shames a man can never reason away, though he looks back and piles up reasons over them 40 dozen deep. And maybe those are the shames a man never should reason away. So yeah, it's just so eloquent, so well worded. <laughs> and that is foreshadowing that clearly is written by someone who is just a fantastic writer, right? And yeah, going back to how this book, like the technical way it's written with the perspective jumps and the head hopping and all of that, like so well done. And I know I've already compared it to this before, but Beloved by Toni Morrison is, I think the only other book I've read that jumps around to this extent in a way that like should be so confusing and messy, but because they are so skilled, it just ends up being just so incredible. And then I also wanted to talk about Joe Ben real quick because he's just such a fantastic character. He's like one of my favorite characters that I have read in any book. And he's just so good. Like he's just such a good person. But usually I don't like that because usually when char when books write someone who's just so good, it comes across as like unrealistic, right? And they just don't feel real because who's that good? <laughs> so it just bothers me. And I find myself being more annoyed with this character who's supposed to be so good. Whereas Joe Ben, Joby, he just, he feels so real and it feels so genuine and his goodness just comes from a place that's like so true and genuine and sincere, you know? And so he is just an incredible character and I loved him so much and he is so well written. Uh, but one of the downsides I did want to talk about, and I don't think I talked about this in my video last year, but there are a lot of racial slurs in this book, even though like it's a bunch of white characters calling each other the N-word, so they're not saying it towards a person of color. But even so, it uh, is still offensive and bothersome, and it's annoying that it's used so often. We do have, you know, like, Peters and Shelley are two Black characters, but they are, like, very minor characters. Uh, and then we have Jenny, who is Native American, and she is a prostitute, and there are some times where negative racial th things are said towards her, so that is used towards a person of color. But then we also have Henry, like the patriarch of the family, and he is very much a racist. But the book itself like doesn't have a racist message because we also have the character of Viv who points out like she gets in a debate with Henry because she's pointing out how he's wrong with his like white superiority ideas. And so they get in this argument because she disagrees with him. And then we have Hank who he uses the N word with his white friends, but he himself like isn't so like obviously a racist the way Henry is you know? So yeah, even though the book, like I said, the book in and of itself doesn't have a racist message to it, there are a lot of racial slurs and there are things that are like offensive to read. And so I did want to give people a heads up. And if you are someone who doesn't want to read a book because it uses the N word, then I don't blame you. <laughs> so I did want to just give people that heads up. And then I did mention Jenny and she is like a key character and I'm going to get into some spoilers here because the book ends with a scene with Jenny and I still am confused about the point of the ending and like what it's implying. So if anyone has read this book and like knows the symbolism of the ending, I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. But yeah, so like to get into spoilers, so she is a prostitute, but lately not many people have been coming by, right? And so her bed has been empty for a long time. And so she does this like rich 
ritual to try to get a man to her. And she tries to get Henry because Henry is a guy where like he had insulted her in the past. And so she like hates him, but she also is kind of in love with him apparently, or like has this weird obsession with him. And so she does this ritual to try to like bring Henry to her. And it seems like Henry appears to her at the end once Henry in real life has died. And so once he has died, suddenly this other version of him appears with Jenny. And that's how the book ends. It's like she's, you know, now gonna go have sex with this guy who has, who is like the reincarnation of Henry, I guess. And yeah, I'm very confused. <laughs> like I, I don't know what Kesey is saying with that ending and what it means and the symbolism and whatever. Like, so I'm still at a loss. <laughs> I thought a second time around, I would have more insight and catch things and be able to make sense of it, but I still don't make sense of it. So if you do know what the meaning is, I would love for you to comment down below and enlighten me. Which speaking of Jenny, so we have this other character named Simone. And it was interesting because after I finished this, I was reading someone else's review and they were talking about this character, Simone, being like, what was the point of her character? Like <laughs> none of the main characters ever talk to her. Like she doesn't do anything with the plot. Like what was the point? And we actually have other characters like this as well, such as like the homeless bolt cutter guy. And I think their characters are there just to show how like the strike and the stubbornness of the Stamper family, it shows how their actions affected the entire town, like everybody. And so even though we have some characters that aren't crucial at all to the plot, we still hear their story and we just, it like fleshes out the whole town as a character and just as a whole and how the whole town and all the people are affected by what's happening. So I assume that's why he included characters such as that. And I love books that get into the details with each of the characters, whether they're big or small, Small, and this book definitely does that. So if that annoys you, if you're like, I don't need to hear about this character if they don't relate to the plot, <laughs> then I could see you being annoyed with this book because we get into detail with like every single character. And there are quite a few, but I never mix them up because they're all so distinct. But yeah, all in all, I would still give this five stars. It is one of the best written books that I have come across. Like I said, in a technical way, it is just so well written. And also just in the story and in the characters and like so many characters, you just want them to just express themselves to each other, right? And just be open with each other. And as a reader, it can feel like so obvious and so easy. Like just tell him what you feel. But you know, we've all been in that situation, I think you know, most of us, at least I have, where you feel like you should express yourself or say something, but either one, you just don't have the words to express yourself and you don't know how to, or you just get too scared, which is the case with some of these characters where they just get closed off around certain people and they just get too nervous or whatever. And so they don't open up the way they should. So yeah, I just thought it was very well written and I loved all of the characters, loved them as in like they were just all so well-rounded and so interesting. And I mean, honestly, like Henry and Hank in particular are just very stubborn, but they still just have so much character and are so fun and interesting to read about, even when they're annoying you or doing something that's wrong. Uh, and then the relationships too, I just loved reading about, you know, you have the friendship between Hank and Joe, and then you have, you know, the marriage relationship between Hank and Viv, and then the friendship that goes on between Viv and Lee, and then the relationship Lee has with Hank, which is very conflicted and the drama that went on between Lee's mom and Hank and then all of the other characters and all of their relationships and all the little details that make everyone feel so real. So yeah, anyway, I love this book. I was so sucked into it and so well written, a great story, a lot of suspense and uh, yeah, and I love the ending. <laughs> so, I mean, the Jenny part, I'm not quite sure on, but the ending as a whole, like the bigger part that happens, I really liked. And also since reading this last time, I have since read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I will say One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I don't like, I mean, it's well written, but that one does have a message that is very sexist. And so it's interesting because here, I mean, we really only have one female character and that's Viv, but I thought she was a well-written female character. So at least not all of Kesey's books are sexist, right? Cause this one, I didn't think was. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest also has some like racial undertones as well. So it's kind of sexist and racist where this one, like I said, we do get the racial slurs, but it's not like the message doesn't come across as either sexist or racist. So there's something. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I guess that wraps it up of my book review, spoiler free for sometimes a great notion. If you want to hear more details about this book and hear about the movie, which like I said, it stars Paul Newman, Henry Fonda is in the role of Henry. And then um, Lee Remick plays Viv. I forget the guy who plays Lee. I think his name is Michael or something. But anyway, I highly recommend the movie. I really loved it. And yeah, if you wanna hear more, I will link to my book versus movie video that I have done. And yeah, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye.